Hello, my name is Mr. Rooney. I am faculty leader of English and Media at Bryce High School, and you are most welcome to this informative video on the Higher English Folio Advice. Hopefully, as you will already be aware, the course outline is as follows. The RUA paper is paper one. It is worth 30% of the exam, and that is where the candidate has two passages, and they have to answer questions predominantly in the first passage, and then the final question is based on both passages. They then have paper two, which is the critical reading paper, and that is where they have to undertake questions on their set text, and then write a critical essay. And the third part of the exam, I suppose, is externally assessed by the SQA, that is the folio, that's what we'll be discussing during this presentation. It is worth 30%, but this year, the SQA have taken away one of the folio pieces. They usually have to do two. So whatever they get out of 15, it will be doubled to give them a mark out of 30. And I will talk a little bit about that in a future slide. So the coursework can be completed throughout the year. And it's usually submitted just before Easter um, to the SQA. There are three choices we can go to in terms of what they can write about. So we've got a persuasive choice, argumentative, and then we have a reflective and a creative genre that they can dip into for this particular essay. So as I say, candidates usually have to submit two pieces, but this year the SQA, in the response um, to the pandemic, have once again said that they only need to submit one. Um, that brings with it both positives and negatives. Um, brilliant that we've one less essay to do, but obviously there is so much more responsibility and weight now placed on that one essay because it is effectively worth one third of their exam. And the class teacher can of course help the candidate plan their essay um, and it can mark one draft of work and provide feedback on how to improve um, the The final piece should be no longer than um, 1,300 words. There's 10% allowance above this, however, really try and stick to the word count as much as possible. Um, the SQA have uh, no advice on minimum word count, but it's quite interesting if you read the course reports um, for uh, the folio and for higher in particular, they tend to find that shorter essays, and I think anything below 1,000 words, would tend to be self-penalizing. Uh, I just don't think that you're going to get the most out of um, the 30% available by doing anything under 1,000 words or higher. As you can see there, the essay will be marked out of 15. Um, obviously, now that it's only one essay, it will be doubled, and that will give a candidate percentage out of 30. So, what are the options? So, as previously discussed, we could go down the persuasive argumentative route. We could write a creative short story, or we could write a reflective piece. I'm going to take you through all the options, um, a brief overview of how to structure, give you some advice, and then to finish off, kind of suggest how uh, parents and carers could help out. So when it comes to argumentative writing, I always tend to go with persuasive. I think it gives you more options in terms of writing just one point of view. It really does narrow the mind in terms of your research and in terms of thinking about pushing forward one argument. I think it gives you more opportunity, certainly, to play about with language as well. Um, on the screen there, you can see several options for uh, topics. Some are rooted in the past. So, for example, the mass shootings in the USA, gun control has been a problem for a while now in America. Um, we've got a few new ones there in terms of certainly the cost of living crisis I think will be a popular one this year. Reality TV is always quite popular um, as is uh, social media. I think it's something that you have to think long and hard about because it needs to be something you're invested in, something you actually want to write about or else you'll find the process a lot harder than it could be. I think one of the most important things when you're tackling your persuasive piece and to give you a great foundation is to do your research, right? Don't skip out that part. Due diligence is key in terms of getting this part right. So you've got 
options there um, on the screen of where to go. I think the majority obviously are going to be circulating around online sources. They're the easiest to go to. You've also got newspapers, um, which are you know really good sources of evidence. Anecdotally, you've got family members and friends. If you want to bring that in, that can be strong evidence as well. But just be careful and be selective about what you are bringing in. What is your evidence? And is it fully backing up the points that you have made in your essay? It really needs to strengthen and almost prove the points that you're making. So it's key to get that right from the start. The other thing I would do from the start is make sure whenever you put down a quote that you like the look of, or a source, or a stat, or a fact, make sure that you're writing down or copying and pasting the URL of where you got it. Right? Keep a list of where you got your information because at the end of the piece you're going to have to note down your sources for a persuasive essay and those need to be specific. They can't just say you know, bbc.co.uk. It needs to be the specific website that the source can be checked because obviously plagiarism is a, a key worry when it comes to persuasive writing. This work needs to be your own work. So everything needs to be properly. The basic structure that um, we would always adhere to is on the screen now. You, you would have an introduction where you would very much make clear your position. What are you arguing for? You know, what is your stance on this topic? What is your point of view? And then you would have a series of arguments um, and I would always try and build in terms of strength. So I, I certainly wouldn't weigh in, first of all, with my, you know, my strongest argument. I would build it to, to, to the point where you're, you're reaching around point four, the strongest point that you have. Now, the last point then before your conclusion is called the opposing argument. Right? And this is where you dismantle the strongest point of opposition. I'll talk a little bit about that in a further slide. And at the end, you reaffirm your position in your conclusion, right? This is what I have proven. This is what I believe. And it's a chance to really hammer home what your opinion is. Chance to really leave the reader in no doubt. And it's always nice to bring the essay full circle. So, introduction then. There are several things that we can do here in terms of grabbing the reader's attention. You really want to kind of make your essay stand out from the start. The intro is the perfect place to do that. There's four different types of introduction you can have a think about. If your essay is a particularly emotive one, you, you could do a, one that uses quite a lot of emotive language that really appears to the sympathy and empathy of the reader, right? That this is shocking and it can no longer continue. You can also use rhetorical questions. So I talked earlier about the mass shootings in America. That, that would be a particularly emotive subject and would suit an emotive introduction. You could go with the shocking fact or statistic where you introduce something that would have a large impact on the reader, um, something that really grabs the attention straight away and, and makes them think about the issue, right? Draws them in in that sense of, well, this is a, this is a fact, this is a statistic. It, you know, it can't be disproved. So really strong opening in terms of shocking the reader into grabbing their attention, right? I think that works a lot when you have, you know, a huge amount of information and statistical data um, to bring the reader in with. I think that's a good one in terms of topics like, say, it was childhood obesity. If you were talking about that and how that's a problem at the minute, you would bring in a stat with just how many you know children are actually classed as overweight at the minute that would be a shocking statistic to read and you would open up your argument from there you have the third type of introduction which is the imagine a world opening it's where you create the idea that if the nature of your topic persists it will end in disaster so a really basic example imagine a world where the oceans have risen above the level of your house and the temperatures have plummeted well below freezing unfortunately you will not have to imagine in a few years as this is the reality of climate change so again that that can be twisted and bent to um any topic of your choosing um obviously fits quite nicely here with this idea of climate change but 
as I said earlier, could easily twist that to, for example, the cost of living essay. And finally, you can use an anecdotal opening. So you can choose a short incident or a story that perfectly sums up this point of view. It could be from your personal experience. It could be something that you've come across in terms of your research. Then that should, you know, that really, that explanation of the, the anecdote should lead into why things need to change. It should perfectly sum up your point of view and why things need to now change for the better. I think at the end of your introduction, your position should be very clear. You know, there should be a no doubt for a persuasive essay which side you fall on in terms of being quite direct and quite forceful, right? Because what you're going to do then is lead into the main body where you're effectively going to go through your points and discuss, well, this is my stance and here's all the reasons why I believe that. I think that's really important to do because you don't want the reader second guessing or doubting which which side you fall on. It needs to be very clear from the start, right? And that you are going through your strongest points then and saying, well, this is why, and then this is why, this is why, and can you believe this? So it just reaffirms the whole way that there is no other point of view. And when you come across the opposition paragraph, well, this is their strongest thing to say, and we're going to dismantle that. So it should be clear from the outset what side you're going to go for. So as I said previously, you really want to build an argument. Um, you, you may want to start off by looking at the problem itself in terms of that first point that you want to make. Where did this originate from and why is that a problem in itself? And then you want to build your arguments from weak to strong. So you want to have about four or five points maximum that should all be in favour of your point of view. And the final point before we deal with the opposition should be your strongest point. And ideally at this stage, you will have supplemented your arguments with facts or stats or expert opinion. But in terms of this one, it, it should be an almost infallible. You, you know, you can't break this one apart because this is the stats and these are the facts that are already in place. How can it be argued against? So it needs to be a very, very strong point at that stage. Throughout the main body, I think what is important is that you, you remind yourself the case you need to read through your work and see am I actually using any techniques here remember the SQ are very much interested in the quality of your writing okay the topic's important and the, how you address it is obviously important but it's very much about the quality of how you have written the piece is going to dictate the mark you get so don't forget your techniques so you've got things like rhetorical questions repetition hyperbole and means just gross exaggeration where you over exaggerate to get your point across facts and statistics like we've already discussed and that idea if it's an emotive topic by all means bring in your emotive language these need to be used like seasoning like salt and pepper too much the meal will be ruined the same with the essay you want to sprinkle them throughout so they have the most powerful impact that they can so use them at stages and, and at areas where you think that it would only go to emphasize or highlight or push forward the point that you're making within the paragraph. And be selective. Make sure you have a mix of techniques in your piece. As I say, the paragraph before the conclusion is all about dismantling the opposition. So the last stage then is thinking, right, say you were in an argument with your friend. And they said something and you thought, right, well, if I can break this argument apart, it will only go to strengthen my own point of view, my own argument. And it's exactly the same thing here. You want to pick, you want to think, right, if I was the opposition, if I was writing this essay from an opposite point of view, what would the strongest thing I could say be? And at that stage, you want to absolutely break that apart. You want to come with a fact or a statistic or an expert opinion that absolutely cuts through that opinion, that point. Because by dismantling it, you will only go to strengthen your own argument. And finally, the conclusion. So conclusion is a general summing up of your arguments, but I would be very careful about going through each argument again. That's not what it's about. What is the overall point of your essay? What have you discovered after setting about your task? Have you achieved this beyond any reasonable doubt? 
make a concerted effort to hammer home your point of view and in some way try and bring the essay full circle. Did you start off with a question? Did you start off with a statistic or a quote or an idea or imagine the world? If that's the case, how can you bring that full circle after all of your arguments? Okay, what have you answered? What have you found out? So think carefully about your intro and then bring it full circle in the conclusion. Right? It should be a nice sort of wrapping up of the essay. And the audience should be left in absolutely no doubt at the end. Maybe leave them with a quote or a stat, some food for thought. What's going to happen in the future? What should happen? Where should we go from here? So there should be no doubt about where you want to leave them with your point of view. The next option is the creative or short story option. Um, the short story, uh, let's be clear, is not a cut down novel. So in a novel the author has time, many many chapters, many many days, even years, to string out, plot out the events in the lives of the characters. Right? A short story takes the characters an important point of their lives and it's this idea of a snapshot. Right? We, we don't need an elongated story of um, their life story or a, a, you know, a little story that takes place over years. We are looking at a snapshot, right? a significant moment. My biggest piece of advice here when you're coming to an idea is keep it contained. You have 1,300 words, right? 1,300 words to play with. So keep it very contained. Keep the idea small. And then you can focus then on your characters, your setting, your description, the dialogue, but the idea needs to be contained. Okay? It doesn't need to be mundane or boring, it just needs to be contained within a small area. Okay? So within that, only certain things should happen. Therefore, you get this idea of snapshot. Okay? It doesn't bounce around from different settings or different areas or different places or from one time to the next. Fairly contained. There's some ideas there on the screen to get you to get you help thinking about what this little idea could be. I mean, these are very generic. I, I always like to kind of place um, the idea of a snapshot with the idea of war or conflict, you know, and a very easy one to go to is um, in the trenches, you know, spending that time thinking about having to go over the top. What, what are those thoughts that run through the head? What happens? When he springs over the top, what does you know? What does that soldier see? What is happening to his comrades? Very very simple snapshot, um, but gives ultimate room to describing um, the scene in terms of what's going on around, but also describing his feelings, her feelings, and that of um, their fellow soldiers as they kind of launch themselves um, into battle. So always important to have what you think what would my snapshot be what what could i contain it with what what is my idea i think the next thing you need to think about is what what perspective do you want to write the story in right whose point of view will you present the story so it's done in first or third person so you in first person you, you tell it from the point of view of one of the characters so you write in first person using i you basically putting yourselves in their shoes and you are putting yourself in the mind of the character right Everything the reader sees, they sees it through. They see it through that character, basically. Okay, but the other way is third-person narrative. So this is where you tell the story from the point of view of someone not in the story. So you would use pronouns he and she. Right. This means the story can be told from a more objective point of view, not narrowed down to the perspective of one character. So it's really up to you to choose from the outset which style you would like to um, write your story in. The characters then, very much at the heart of the story, they need to seem real. The plot of the story should reveal something about them, that you know they should change in some way, perhaps go through a crisis or a moment of tension in their lives. My suggestion would be to limit the amount of characters to three. Very, very difficult to keep track of more than that, 
or to sort of outline more characters than that in 1300 words. Also, I think with the character, um, you, you need to reveal them through their actions and their gestures, not just through dialogue. I think sometimes you think, we'll get this character through what they're saying. It needs to be, they need to be believable. Whatever setting they're in, whatever problem they're facing, their actions and their gestures need to be authentic. So they need to be believable characters in order for the story to work. Next thing to think about is, well, where am I going to place these characters? Where is the setting of my story going to happen? And, a, and an effective setting can really bring the story to life. It can certainly add color um, you know, and bring it from black and white into maybe developing those gray areas as well. The, the description of your setting will be key. Okay. Sometimes it's easier, as it says there, to place it somewhere familiar, somewhere where you've been. Not necessarily where you spend every day, but somewhere you've actually been to. Okay? It can it can be drawn on through experience. It's much more likely to be realistic. Even if you're creating, you know, say a dystopian future or a sci-fi setting, you will be able to draw on sources of uh, video games, sources like films, TV programs, and you'll be able to take small nuggets from each of those in order to create your setting okay and that's not plagiarism that that's taking artistic license that's looking at well what is what what are the little areas that i like out of all these things and how can i mold them together to construct my own setting obviously if you're taking a setting whole scale from somewhere and um, then that would be plagiarism so you want to try and keep it obviously authentic and original but you will have influences as suggested in those different arenas with plot, I think, you know, from primary school, we've been taught beginning, middle and end. Um, actually, I tend to look at plot um, over five points. And you can track your plot through this very simple little diagram um, over the five areas. Now, when you become skilled at writing, you can start playing about with this structure in terms of flashbacks and flash forwards. If I'm getting an idea in my head, first and foremost, I'm going to think about it in, in this structure, right? the five main plot points. Now I'm going to take you through those five main plot points and if I was planning a story I would have this structure drawn out on a page and I would fill in a little bit of information at each point just to get in my head where am I taking this character? Okay, What is the plot of the story? Because sometimes when you're eager and you're excited to get writing you'll start writing and you'll get to about you know halfway through two or three or even perhaps to four and you think Right, I don't necessarily know where I'm going next. Kind of understand how my character got here, but I don't know where to go next. And that's the problem. It needs to be fleshed out and drawn out in your planning process before you actually start writing. So the five plot points that we were talking about there are, are very much a little bit of an expansion from beginning, middle and end. So in any exposition or start of story, we would be introduced to our characters, we would learn the setting, and we would be introduced to some problem, some idea of conflict that needs to be resolved. The next part is the rising action, so the, the little jaggy bit of the mountain as we go up. This part starts to develop the, the, the different conflict or conflicts. And this is where we start to build interest and suspense in our characters or the problems of our characters. This is where this happens. We then have the climax. And that's really the, the highest point of tension where they come face to face with a conflict or, or the, the problem that has taken place. And at this point, the main character will have to decide um, and they will probably make a decision that will change them in some way. When we get into the, the falling side of the mountain, in terms of four, we're into our falling action. We start to tie up the loose ends of the plot. Okay? So the conflict and the climax are, are taken care of. And we move towards the resolution of our story, the end of our story. Now it says here the story comes to a reasonable ending. Yeah, and that's absolutely fair. It needs to be understood, right? It needs to have some sort of definitive end. That doesn't mean, though, that you can't leave it on a cliffhanger. It just has to be reasonable. That cliffhanger needs to be built towards, okay? Rather than just coming out of nowhere. So a little bit of foreshadowing, okay? Laying of clues along the plot line to set up a, a cliffhanger, to set up an ending, absolutely fine. 
but it, it can't just be brought in out of nowhere. It needs to be thought about in terms of bringing it in. I think dialogue is important in terms of what the characters say uh, aloud. It absolutely helps bring them to life. It should again be realistic and authentic. Um, I, I would be very careful in terms of how much I play about with dialogue. It should be there, yeah, but again it's that salt and pepper idea. Too much, um, it gets a little bit too confusing. Okay, and we lose track of what's going on, right? So be sparing with dialogue, but use it as effectively as you can, right? So use it wisely. And obviously, you know, put inverted commas around the exact words the characters are saying and start a new paragraph if there is a conversation between speakers. It makes it very clear then to follow the dialogue between characters. I think description is going to be one of your key ones in terms of certainly setting and character um, but uh, description and dialogue are key to get that balance right okay it, it should have a point the thing that you're describing should add to something in your story it should add to character or it should add to setting or even maybe a little bit of foreshadowing so example there a description of building or scenery can create atmosphere so the, the weather, if you're using pathetic fallacy, could perhaps be atmospheric for a reason. And the description of the characters can reveal something about their personalities. So it's really important that you actually be sparing with, with your description, but it needs to be there. Be very selective about what you describe. But I think setting and characters are two key things where that needs to come in. The third option is reflective. So in a piece of reflective writing, it's not just about giving an account of an experience, but it's about how you felt, how you felt before it, how you felt during it, and most importantly, I think, how we felt later on. What was our overall reflection looking back at that incident? So you should select any experience, really, that lets you do more than simply recalling events. And this is sometimes what I say to pupils, don't let it fall into the trap of just retelling a story, right? That's not what this is about. It's about reflecting on something. It's about how you've changed, how you've grown, how you've developed. And I think maybe asking ourselves the following set of questions um, help us really think about more than just something that happened, an event that happened. It starts to help us to think about, right, well, how did I feel about that? So. On the, on the screen there, you have a fairly straightforward set of questions, but there are questions designed to kind of uh, poke and prod about your past, about things that have happened to you that maybe you've talked about, but maybe you haven't talked about before. The things that maybe would really be good to actually dig into for a reflective piece. Now, these ideas, these things don't need to be huge life-changing experiences by any stretch of the imagination. It can be something very simple. It can be a friendship, or how a friendship has changed, or how a, a mentor has maybe entered your life and really helped you kind of discover that, yeah, I, I'm actually more capable than I thought I was previously. It, it doesn't have to be, you know, something where you have to absolutely dig into the past and really do that soul searching and you know you, you can go down and pick topics if you're comfortable with picking them that are that are quite deep and quite sensitive you might find it a cathartic experience to write about but my key bit of advice is they don't have to be they can be something much simpler but that small process that small little incident led to a much bigger reflection in terms of your growth your personality and you as a person So, a sense of your personality absolutely needs to be included, right? The, the reader needs to get a sense of who you are. And you have to express your thoughts and feelings, right? You're going to hear this from your teachers quite a bit. What were your thoughts and feelings? And it's not just about telling them. It's not just about saying them. We'll talk about how to do that in, a, in the next slide. But you, the thoughts and feelings need to be there. They need to be there, well, previously going into the incident, the incident itself, and as a result, how we felt after. So it's not just an account, it's, it's reflecting on it. 
that is key you're going to hear that over and over again if you choose this topic for your essay it's about reflection clues in the title you can uh, treat it in an entertaining way so if you're particularly adept or adroit at using humor that could come in and, and be a big part of your personality i think we as a celtic nation are, are very good at using humor in order to reflect and in order to deal with things in our lives and it needs to have an appropriate style so a chatty tone and a formal tone may be more suitable than a formal one however it needs to be controlled okay it, you know it still needs to be written well so it needs to be accurate and in terms of punctuation and grammar but you may want to be slightly informal in terms of your treatment of the topic so in planning this there are certain things that i would always kind of talk about and discuss so the first thing would be to, to note down you know your thoughts right including what happened during the experience what happened before what happened during and what happened after what what were your thoughts and they, they can be very small little snippets but they should enable you to track change they should enable you to go well that's what i was thinking before and this happened and that's what i was thinking when it was happening and this is what i think now so it's that process of tracking how your thoughts have changed where does where did the experience happen it, it does that have a, you know a place in this essay does does that need to be really described and explained because actually it, it really does unlock some of the ideas that you're trying to talk about so the easiest one to think of when it comes to that is say you, you, you're talking about that transition from primary into secondary as your idea and, and how much of an experience that was and, and how that changed you you might want to go into detail about the differences between the buildings you know that sensory idea that you know primary was all you know joyful and light and glitter and colors and then when you went to secondary it was almost like a maze there was so many places to go and discover and change was 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 every day something was changing all the, all the different types of teachers that you then had to encounter all the different classrooms where previously in primary school you had that one secure classroom and it's that that idea of growth that idea of moving on and, and dealing with those new feelings and emotions but the setting can be sometimes really important the experience itself important to note down what happened during that time and um, how did you feel did anything jump out at you as out of the ordinary we want more than just the basic story right but but in our planning what happened right in a series of events can you just detail what went on next thing that i would focus in on that i would look at quite closely are feelings you know and, and sometimes it's the most difficult thing to do but note down how you felt at the time right what feelings are you going to try and communicate at the different stages of your essay what we want to do is by showing the reader as well as telling okay and what that means is we sometimes want to drift into using imagery to express how we're feeling and certainly our word choice is going to be key but the first thing we need to do before we start changing things into imagery and uh, thinking about our word choice is well, what are the actual feelings that we need to play about with? This is very much, if it's a reflective piece, it needs to be about you. So your personality needs to come through here, right? So you need to be thinking, how is that going to happen? Is it going to happen in a dialogue? Is it going to happen in addressing the reader? Is it going to happen through humor? Is it going to happen in terms of my emotional side and or my empathy what part of your personality is going to come through in this essay and then the other thing is it's always likely that there are going to be other players involved other people involved in this experience you need to think about well what are they like how are you going to show the reader what they're like how are you going to get that across again are you going to use a bit of imagery there um, again just even thinking of the teacher perspective how you know potentially primary was you know almost like this guardian angel and oh they were so lovely and then when we got to secondary oh it was, it was terrible you know what i mean joking about a bit there but that idea of how do people impact that experience that's going to be key in terms of showing the reader 
what those people were like and their importance in that journey. Techniques again are obviously going to be really important um, in terms of this piece. So you've got the opportunity to flash back and flash forward. The, I sometimes say the easiest way to think about reflection is to think about yourself driving in a car. So you're driving in a car and you're reflecting on the experience around you, the driving journey. What are you going to have to do? Well, in order to be safe, in order, in order to kind of take care of yourself within that environment, you're going to have to use, obviously, your senses around you. And you're going to have to use the mirror system. Now, you've obviously got several mirrors within the car, so you've got your rear view mirror, right? So you're looking back, in your rear view mirror, you're looking back at what's gone past, what's happened behind you, right? what's going on in that, in that idea, what's going on in that viewpoint. But you've also got, obviously, what's going on in front of you. Right? So you look forward through the windscreen and you have to adapt to what's going on and what's upcoming. So it's these different viewpoints, these different perspectives that are going to be key in terms of your reflection. But you've got to take account of them all. I think your description, your use of imagery and word choice is also what the SK are really honing in on. It's what they want to see. How, how good are you? playing about with imagery and word choice to get across meaning right show don't tell right don't don't be explicit be implicit show it through the image and an easy one to do is sometimes it's nice to get an extended metaphor where you can track your reflection over the period of your essay easy one to do and um, really simple off the top of my head is that idea of if you're talking about a change in metamorphosis you know, the comparison to Caterpillar and going into the cocoon, that period of reflection, that idea of change and then coming out the butterfly. Right? Really, really simple idea in terms of tracking change. Senses are always really important, but again, that salt and pepper idea, use them sparingly. Use them when they matter most, when they're going to carry the most impact. Varied sentence structure, I suppose, is key, not just for this essay, but, you know, for, for all of our uh, essays that we've discussed so far, um, short dramatic sentences, interesting syntax, parenthesis, rhetoricians, repetition, all key in terms of making your essay interesting. And again, you could maybe, if you're on that humorous side of, of things, you could bring in hyperbole, uh, irony, a bit of sarcasm there, all adds to getting your personality across. The helpful advice that I can give here, um, as you can see on the screen, a couple of things that I would highlight in particular. The idea that your personality needs to come across. Okay, I think the, the imagery, as we've already discussed, really important. The same as uh, the use of your senses when, you know, when it will actually have an impact in terms of your essay. And the, the structure. Okay. What, what, I, what I don't like seeing when I get an essay back is this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened. You know, it's very much about taking the incident. So you could start off your essay by, you know, very, very powerful and impactful paragraph about in the midst of the incident, the highest point of tension. And then you could take your reader back, you know, before that happened. And then slowly build up it again. What happened? And then your reflection, how have you changed as a result of that? So you need to play about with your structure. You need to think very carefully what works for you in terms of structure. What would, what would suit you? And more importantly, what would suit the experience in terms of laying it out? But again, we come back to the point that I've made previously and other slides. That reflection needs to be there. That idea that you've thought about this and in some way you've moved forward. You've changed. Right, how you're going to be in the future, what what lessons you've taken moving forward as a person. That that's key in terms of this essay. Been there, done that. I've got a couple of candidates here that have already been through the higher course. They've got some ideas and advice to give you um, about higher and about the folio in particular. But all you need to do is listen, right? Because as I say, 
they they had definitely some honesty um, about their answers and hopefully some nuggets in there that you can take forward and think about as you go through the folio uh, process this year. So we have Ailey Anderson who is a house captain for Petland and is also actually taking advanced hire this year. I thought um, she gives an interesting insight into her hire journey. Um, what is the big difference between that five and hiring risk for yourself? Ailey? Um, I would say one of the biggest differences was you had to take on more of your studying for yourself. There was less, you still work a lot with your teacher, but practices and revision is more on you and what you want to get. So you have to put in more effort there. And what aspect, I suppose, picking up on that point, what aspect did you find most difficult to simulate into in terms of the components? Um, probably I would say timing and getting your um, pacing right in exams so you don't go too in depth and end up with no time to finish your exam or you don't finish it too fast and end up with not enough information it's hard to get that balance right I think I think that comes through practice yeah um, definitely um, what what's the best piece of advice um, for anybody taking higher this year when they're doing the folio definitely to write about something you're passionate about and something that you feel like you'll have a lot to say on because it's always better to start with too much to write about than not enough. And if you start doing your folio and you find that your topic isn't working for you and you can't get into it, um, change it as soon as you can basically because um, it's going to be easier after that. Because I think you experienced that, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I started off with a pretty different topic to the one that I finished with, but it made so things easier all once I changed. Out. Yeah. Um, and for anybody taking higher this year, um, just from your own experience, what's the best piece of advice you'd give? Um, definitely revise regularly because when it comes to exams and prelims, um, cramming for English is very difficult because it's a lot of information. And especially for things like poems, if you know your poems and you know your quotes, then it's going to make everything go a lot smoother when it comes to those times. Super. Thanks very much, Ed. Hi Ben, uh, Ben's one of our school captains um, uh, at Bryce High School and I've asked him along just to give us a wee bit of information about his experience in higher English. So Ben, I'm just going to start off with a fairly easy question. What do you think the big difference is for yourself in terms of um, National 5 and higher? Uh, certainly the workload is a massive jump between that 5 and higher uh, and the kind of amount of work you need to put in outside the school. Uh, and within your class, you need to kind of give your maximum effort to make sure you achieve well. Thanks, Ben. What, what aspect in terms of moving from that five to higher uh, with the course components that you find, um, the, I suppose, the most tricky to kind of uh, align yourself with? Uh, I've always kind of found the course reading, RUE, a bit more difficult. I've never been kind of the biggest reader, uh, so definitely the standard of the complexity within the text uh, was quite a big jump. Uh, but also you still need to kind of write a lot more uh, with that big jump. And folio Ben, because obviously you needed to write another folio piece at higher. What's the best bit of advice you could give uh, someone this year going into the folio? 100% be on the ball with it. Uh, get it in as early as you possibly can. Uh, whenever you get drafts back, make sure you try and implement the advice that's given. Uh, just because the teachers obviously have a bit more of an idea than you do. And finally, Ben, um, for anybody taking higher this year, just from your own personal perspective, what, what is the number one piece of advice that you would you would give the candidates? Uh, just try and be consistent. Try and set yourself that ground level uh, from the start of the year and work at that steady pace all the way through and don't try and cram everything in at the end. Perfect. Thanks very much, Ben. So I've got um, Isla Campbell, who is another of our uh, school captains. I'm going to ask her the same few questions, uh, just about her experience of higher. So big difference between that five and higher English, Isla, what did you find? Uh, I did think there was definitely like quite a big jump. I would say the biggest jump that there is, is you don't get quotation marks anymore. I think across the board in RUEE, in your set text, in your essays, not having those extra marks does make it quite a challenge especially when you're first getting started because 
you don't you're used to getting these marks that are quite a uh, good marks to get they're quite easy they kind of boost up your score whereas it does mean that your sort of analysis and stuff does need to be in a lot more depth which is obviously that jump to higher so i do think for me that was the biggest change i noticed okay what what, what aspect what component of the course do you think you found um i've said most difficult but what what one did you maybe take longer to come to grips with uh, I think my essays, like my essays were definitely like a progression throughout the year. Like at the beginning, I found that I was actually really overwriting and um, because I was so kind of nervous that I wasn't going to get these marks, I was writing far too much than I ever would be able to do in the time period that I was given. So it was more about refinement for me and actually trying to figure out what were the important points and what were just like telling the narrative uh, of like whatever book or play you were studying. And in terms of the coursework, in terms of folio, what would be your, your, your golden nugget of advice? Something you're passionate in. Like, I could not have done my folio if I did not care about my topic. Like, I found when looking at different folio ideas, there was ones that I was like, oh, you know what, this could make a really good folio, but I actually don't care. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't care less about the topic. So the minute I actually found something that I was passionate in and that could give me a lot of, um, like research, it made it a lot easier. I completely agree. <laughs> and then just overall, obviously you've been through two interesting years, the um, the assessments um, of your Nat 5 and then the full back to normality, quote unquote, SQA year. Um, someone came up to you and said, uh, help me out, what, what's, the, what's that golden nugget? Um, I would probably say, make sure you're doing your prep work at the start. I feel like I saw quite a few people like um, kind of doing the bare minimum at the start and then when it came to exams they had to create all these sort of like flashcards and like essay plans and everything and I found that for me say creating them from the start and being able to develop them and make them better really helped. Also being able to condense down everything for me like when you have a lot of essays or a lot of poems or whatever you're looking at to do I found that it can be a little bit overwhelming having a lot of information. So I think the minute you're able to condense down your information into your own words, things that make sense to you, things that you can learn easily from is the minute that it will come and you can make it sound professional once you're in the exam, but for your notes, make it simple for you. Perfect, really appreciate that, thank Thanks. you. I suppose the next thing that we need to think about is as parents and carers, what can you do? How can you help? This is a, a big piece of work. This is one essay worth 30% of the exam and I'm sure that there are areas that you think, do you know what, I quite like to chip in. I, I quite like to help out, but how can I do that? So the next few slides hopefully will be um, about all the different ways that you can actually chip into this process. The first thing is to uh, be aware of the SQA materials. So I've put the, the hyperlink um, here at the top and this will lead you to the Understanding Standards website for Higher English. Now it's full of information not just for um, the folio, you can see here it's for Reading for Understanding and the Critical Reading Paper, the essay and the set text. Now if you go to this website and you navigate on the, the left hand side you'll see quite clearly Higher Portfolio Writing. What you want to do is you want to click on portfolio writing and that should open up the next stage. So when you open up portfolio writing you will see here that you have a number of options. Now I've went to the 2019 section simply because there are there's, there's more options in terms of the differences between genres so it's quite creative heavy in um, the previous section. So I've opted to, to click on 2019 because you can see here discursive creative, discursive creative. So there's, there's quite a lot of options here in terms of candidates. Now, at this stage what you should do is you can read through um, any essay that you wish uh, in terms of the different options. So you could click on candidate B and it would open up um, the essay. And you can read through which is good. So you see examples of pupils that have already been through higher and what they've written about and, and how uh, they've tackled it. But what's even better is down here, if you go to all commentaries and you open that up, 
it will take you through each candidate from an SQA perspective and it will tell you exactly why they received the score that they did. So it will take you through the entire piece and it will be very specific about what was good and what might needed a little bit more work. And you'll have a vast array of marks within these candidates. So you'll have essays at the bottom of the scale and you'll have essays much more towards the top of the scale. And I think it's be really useful for you as both pupils and parents to go through and see, well, exactly what are the SK looking for? How have these candidates been scored and why? And then starting to think obviously about, well, what process is my child going through at the minute? What one have they chosen? And what are the SQA saying here about that particular essay? Right, well, I need to make sure that I need to fix that within my own, right? I need to maybe have a think about how I can approach this topic so that I can score those higher marks. But I think it's a really useful resource to see candidates work and actually how the SQA um, have judged it. I think reading is really, really important when it comes to um, writing. Um, I think it, it, obviously it helps expand vocabularies. It's that idea of imaginations, um, but it, it's just the way things are written. There, there's a real sense of when you read a piece, you, you, you can understand straight away if that candidate is um, a regular reader because they have a, a grip on, as I say, imagery, vocabulary. The way they use sentence structure, punctuation, it is clear that they have, you know, been, been reading for some time or that that is a, a passion of theirs because it very much comes across in the writing. And I mean that in terms of sophistication. So at the minute, if your child is not reading, that, that's one of the, the easiest things they can do in terms of improving their writing. What you'll also see is though, it improves their essay writing and probably in particular their um, REAE in terms of their understanding of that vocabulary um, and that word choice. So I think in the encouragement of reading um, is absolutely key in terms of, I would say, all three of the components, but portfolio, I think it really does help. Inspiration, I suppose, is always um, important when it comes to choosing uh, what you want to actually write about, what you want to actually talk about. There's some fantastic things um, on TV, on Netflix, um, at the minute that you can dip into some fantastic films and um, that I'm sure that you've either watched yourself or watched together um, but there's always those little nuggets that you could take out in terms of ideas um, I've mentioned the war stories previously the dystopian nature um, of some of the films that have come out some great TV shows line of duty brilliant in terms of that police drama it's another really easy one to do like a snapshot in an interrogation room be a really good idea for a creative piece. So I think a lot can be pulled from what you've been watching either yourself or as a family, or maybe having just a discussion with what they've watched, what are their influences, what would they quite like to write about. And, and that kind of leads me to taking an interest is key, um, asking questions and, and not just closed questions, actually opening up um, and thinking about, right, okay, I know they have this folio to do. Asking about now you know what's involved in the different choices. Well, what choice have you made? Why have you done that? What's your topic? How you know what stance are you going to take? In a short story, well, set the scene for me. And that, may, that might be a bit too big. How about you narrow it down? Reflection. Oh, what instant are you picking? Oh, that's a really good. I remember that time. Do you want to sit and talk about that? Because I remember clearly how you were feeling back then just taking an interest could be huge right and could really actually you know make your child think about things in a, in a slightly different perspective we've all had a journey right we've all had different experiences we've all lived different lives you have definitely something to bring advice to bring to their piece so please best thing you can do is ask and by all means you know don't don't take no for an answer you should be invested uh, and obviously it's coming from the head of English that that is absolutely an appropriate thing to do. And finally, what help can we provide? Well, there's several things, obviously. We've got an open door policy within the faculty. 
we've got after school revision sessions uh, on a Wednesday afternoon, which is study support, but folio questions are more than welcome. We've got uh, study sessions linked in with MADS coming up in 2023. And um, we've got our Twitter page, which sometimes uh, will reference articles and it will have um, our updates about what's going on within the faculty. And obviously you can get in touch with your teacher um, through GLOW or myself at mark.rooney at falkirk.gov.uk. I hope in some way that this has been helpful um, in terms of giving you a little bit more of an insight into the process of all the different folio types and I hope that it enables you to support your child as they move through this process because as I say that 30% is really key in terms of giving them a good foothold before they even walk across uh, the threshold of an exam. So hopefully that's helped you and by all means if there's any further questions do not hesitate to get in contact.